Okay. Uh, Good. Okay. Um, one thing that I will say, just, you here. even though this is not my um, um, my gig here, um, is that if you can, um, in the upper right hand corner of your of your box or somewhere on your screen, there is a mute button. And if you are not speaking, um, you can hit the mute button so that we're not hearing other people's telephone I calls. The water is still there. I didn't touch it passing fire engines and whatever. Um, okay, so um, I'm Marsha Baker. This is not my gig, um, but I am a member of the board of the Historical Society and chair of the Interpretation Committee, and I'm a long-term book club member. And if anybody else wants to pop right in. Um, I don't know if everybody sees the same format. I see Sarah first, then me second, and Joan and Judy. Oh, and you know, nobody seems to sees the same format. No, nobody sees the same. Oh, okay. Yeah. Then that won't help. So, <laughs> no, all right, I'll go next. Um, uh, Sue Rockwell, I'm also a member of the board, and I'm co-chair with Joan of this book group. I'm also on the Cronin Committee, the Programs and Events Committee, the Governance Committee. That's probably enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Joan, why don't you go next? Okay, well, Joan Peg Lucia here. I'm also a member of the board and the Interpretation Committee of Lexington Historical Society. Um, retired teacher and also a tour guide in the Metro Boston area. And it's my pleasure today to introduce or give you some information if you don't know, uh, Mary Keenan. So Mary is going to lead our book club discussion today and I have some wonderful background information uh, we like to spoil her a little bit by giving a lot of good stuff about her, so here goes. Uh, Mary joined the Lexington Historical Society in 1964 when she began teaching U.S. history at the William Diamond Junior High, incorporating resources from the Society's archives into the history curriculum. She transcribed three years of Jonas Clark's diary for the students at Clark Junior High when that school opened in 1972. At Lexington High School, she used society materials to provide background for her students to recreate an 1833 town meeting. In 1985, she was honored as Lexington's Secondary Teacher of the Year. Since her retirement, she has written In Haste, Julia, which is the story of East Lexington's Julia Robbins, which was published in 2011. She moderated the Society's panel on 20th century education in Lexington, currently serves as the clerk of the Society and chairman of the Collections Committee. Her current research focuses on a collection of 1850s Lexington petitions to the Massachusetts General Court against the fugitive slave law and capital punishment, as well as other issues. With undergraduate and graduate degrees from Tufts, Mary remains active in her class activities. She lives in Belmont, was a trustee of the Belmont Public Library for 10 years, and every summer top priority is given to her garden. Take it away, Mary. Well, thank you very much, Joan. And without further ado, let's get looking at Virginia Hall. Does anyone have anything they'd like to say that they can't wait to talk about? Yeah, I'll go for it. Good. Uh, the um, one of the things that I was just noticing, because um, there are actually two books at Virginia Hall. This one and another one called Wolves at the Door. I have read both of them. But the other thing is the amount of um, recent books about women and women in science and women in war. Um, that there just seems to be this, uh, you know, suddenly we have become aware um, that there were actually women in these places and, you know, hidden figures about the women and mathematicians at NASA. Um, two books about Hedy, the actress Hedy Lamarr, um, who was also an engineer. Um, and um, for those of you who don't know, uh, uh, invented a radio guided torpedo system. Um, um, so there are two books about Hedy Loire, The Only Woman in the Room and Hedy's Folly. Um, there's a book, a uh, recent book about Ida Lovelace, who was Lord Byron's daughter, but also the first woman programmer. That's called The Enchantress of Numbers. 
And there's one, if not two books about Madame Fourcade, uh, a French woman who was also a spy. Um, and I just love the fact that they're all out there and they're still coming. Thank you, Masha. You're welcome. And that just is the tip of the iceberg. Yes. Uh, let's look at the questions. Did the book change anyone's mind about what one person can accomplish? Well, she was really one of them. That was a very interesting story. Um, gee whiz. I mean, if you can't be inspired by what she did, I, I don't think you, you can look up to anyone. It's just an incredible story that we really never knew about. Woman of no importance. Uh, particularly with Cuthbert along. Yeah. I, I looked up Cuthbert, and as some of you probably know, he was an English monk and a bishop, um, 1635 to, uh, pardon me, 635 to 687 AD of the Benedictine Abbey of Lindestein and, uh, in Northumbria. He aided plague victims. So I'm not sure why she chose to have her prosthesis with that name, but anyway, it certainly did not make her life any easier. Why do you think she took such gambles for another country? Or for any country? She's a woman who liked to challenge and, she, and to actually do things. She didn't want to sit behind a desk. She was an action person. Okay. Um, being but very, you, yeah, being why, very, go ahead, Masha. Um, being very um, cautious. <laughs> I have um, difficulty um, with people who take chances, and I and I have difficulty um, uh, figuring out why they would do that in the first place. Um, but I I certainly admire people that do. Um, uh, and I just add one other thing here, just logistically. Um, if some of the people whose faces are not showing would care to do that, it would um, make it easier um, in the conversation, especially if people could raise their hands like this when they want to speak um, so that they could be recognized rather than people talking over each other. But I'm sorry. Uh, so anyway, I, I don't have... I can't personally figure out why people do take chances with their with their own lives. Um, and I just wondered if anybody else had any insight into that as to why why people do that. I think Masha had a or Martha had a point that people like to be challenged and some people like to live on the edge of danger. Mm. Look at some of these mountain climbers and uh, people who sail around the world in a, in a sloop. Uh, it seems to me that I would consider them crazy, but um, it's something that is in their blood. Uh, I think um, at some point in the book, it said that um, after losing her leg, she went into a kind of depression yeah. and was hiding her emotions, but she felt better doing something vital she felt more alive instead of feeling dead inside and she had a role she felt better when she had a role and she never felt so free as when she was doing this thank you anyone else I'd like to add on that um it somewhere i read i don't know if it was in the book or just i like to read outside the, the book as well um, she herself somewhere, um, she calls herself capricious and cantankerous. And then she, somewhere in, that I read, she once went to school wearing a bracelet made of live snakes. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, I would not want to sit next to her. I wouldn't either. <laughs> um, it seems that she was wise and discerning and made excellent choices for the most part but uh, her sixth sense didn't seem to work with Al, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, A-L-E-S-C-H, Alish. Uh, why do you think she trusted him? Hmm. He was the one uh, who went into uh, Dr. 
uh, uh, Rosette's office and he had some information for her. It seemed like he was the appropriate courier. And so the doctor gave him the next parcel. And then he came back and insisted on meeting with uh, Virginia, who was with Marie. And she at first had doubts, but the other system of spying that was interconnected with hers was having difficulty. And she thought, well, it needed the benefit of the doubt. Was that a surprise was, to anybody? Was this the, the person named the bishop? Hi, this is Bill yes. Robinson. I can only be on by phone, so you can't see my wonderful visage. Um, but was the person you're saying uh, talking about right now, was that the one who had the nickname the bishop? Yes, mm. he was the one who turned Abbe. out to be the, the yeah, devil. Agent. Right. There was, I the always thought that Abbe. odd, too. Because, I mean, obviously she was amazing in all her attributes and espionage, but there must have been something that uh, I don't know whether she reminded her of her father or some long lost thing. Remember, she did have her own problems. I mean, that that's uh, her problem with her mother stayed throughout the rest of her life, for example. But there was something, and he was such a good uh, dishonest, I mean, he was an a classic horrible person that he was able to really swindle her like he swindled everybody else that he dealt with. Uh, and Dr. Rosé believed in him because he spoke out against the Nazis in church, even though that wasn't an acceptable thing to do in Vichy, France. But um, it certainly led to a lot of difficulty for her whole network. Yeah. Absolutely. Jane, anything to add? Oh, I, I just, um, I think no one's perfect. And so even though she, you know, we look at the amazing, amazing thing that she did, I think, you know, like all of us, we have some blind spots to people. Um, the other thing is, is that she seemed to, um, you know, especially later, uh, she was using an awful lot of speed. And I don't think that your brain works as well uh, when you're, you're on, you know, you're extremely tired, you're up and down, all these kinds of things um, that you're always on top of your, your game. And I think this one just slipped by her. And I'm sure, oh my gosh, how she must have felt afterwards hearing what had happened and all the people and uh, you know that that had to weigh on her i mean that's got to be tough well you know another thing too though because you space uh, put a lot of faith in the fact that he denounced the nazis within his sermons and all that and yet you would have thought that something would have appeared odd to her that he wasn't there wasn't any at least uh impersonation of, of any uh, prosecution of him for that by the Gestapo and that it wasn't brought up by the author of the book, which I thought was kind of odd that that was just a setup. I mean, the Gestapo and all their evil really uh, knew what they were doing and they had set up the first successful decoy of her. Uh, and, and somehow she wasn't able to figure that out. Somebody's screen sharing. <laughs> yeah. Who's Lana? Who's Lana? Okay. We're back. Okay. I agree with Jane that she did have some blind spots, as we all do. What amazed me was she would stand up to the world, but then kowtow to her mother. Yes. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. Particularly when um, she and Paul, after the war, came back to the United States and wanted to get married, but her mother thought Paul was beneath her and beneath them socially. And so they lived apart for years. Yeah, that was interesting. But don't we all do that in the sense that we want people that we would most like to think well of when they don't it's 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 a challenge and we 
do stupid things. <laughs> hmm. She may have felt guilty because, you know, her father had died so long ago and she basically was out of her mother's life for years. She seldom saw her. Um, she main, maintained contact when she could, but maybe she felt she had to be a better daughter or listen to make her mother feel better in some way. Okay. Which part of the story did you find most intriguing? Was there, was it when uh, she was in the mountains at the end where the orphanage was? Or what about that when she got all those people out of the prison, Clan Cameron, and the mm -hmm. man who had lost his legs had the wireless uh, radio underneath his robes and he wheeled in? Or when she was in Lyon, or her trek over the Pyrenees? Does anyone have a favorite part of the book? I think that trek over the Pyrenees was incredible. Uh, she, it was three days and 50 miles and heavy snow. <clears throat> that, and that's incredible. There was a, an author who did another book about her and he tried to trek that and he couldn't believe that she with a prosthetic made it when he just was overwhelmed by trying to do it himself. Quite a journey. It's yeah. amazing that she made it. And then when they got to the end to be put in jail by the yeah. police. Put in jail. Yeah. But what amazed me was that she got out of that jail. You know, her two compatriots went, went on to prison and she went to a local prison, I guess, but got a message out and was able to get out. But it was a couple of weeks, I think, before she actually got out of that prison. And you just be thankful that uh, bureaucracy worked very slowly in those days, I guess. Because if they had known who she was quicker, she would have been dead. Yeah. Well, it always amazed me throughout this whole book how she always gets messages to people and people get messages to her. And there are always all these messages running around. And you wonder how this all worked before cell phones. <laughs> You know, before even with the um, the coding machines, that really didn't work well for a lot of a lot of times. But people were always running around with messages. I think it was wonderful and slightly amazing. It's hard for me to say which of the chapters of her life thrilled me more, <laughs> or Boston. filled me with admiration more. It was just one after another. The mm. trip over the Pyrenees. I don't know an example of courage or grit that comes close to what she endured. But I have to say, the thing, you know, the thing that left me with mm. the most <laughs> terrible, bitter taste in my mouth was, and I know it was the times. I know I'm, I'm criticizing history from a viewpoint of 50 years later, and you're not supposed to do that. But the chauvinism with which she was treated by the men around her, by the leadership. Even the, the British leaders in, in England who loved her, knew her, respected her, knew what she was worth, would not give her a position of leadership because of her gender. And instead chose time after time to make some other completely unworthy male the leader of the group without good results. Spent a fortune, wasted money, wasted lives, and so on, because they just couldn't bring themselves to let a woman be the leader. And then when she retires and she spends 10 years in the CIA, the way she was treated <laughs> by people who knew that she was perhaps more experienced or threatened by her and the way they, they just sidelined her was ah, when they put someone painful, painful to read. Two, two grades below her as her supervisor writing recommendations, not asking what she had done or what she could do to help. And oh. her performance reviews damning with faint praise. I mean, it was just awful. But what would you like to ask? I'm sorry, could, could uh, 
everybody who's not speaking, mute their microphones. There's a tremendous amount of uh, background noise on right now. Yeah. Thank anyway. Um, uh, what, would, what, would, what would you like to ask her? Would you like to ask? Yes. Yeah. Richard and I'm having trouble. I can't do video. What would you like to ask her? Hey, hello. I think I might ask her what advice she'd give young women today. But the person that's on the phone goes on a phone connection, 781-439-4611. Please mute. Getting background noise from you. Um, it, th there were a couple of instances where um, uh, the where she was rejected both in the very beginning, being uh, after her injury, um, being rejected for assignments both as a woman and an, and then being rejected as an MP. Um, you know, so that at the very beginning, and as was just mentioned, at the very, at the very end, with the CIA not recognizing who they had there, um, and uh, you know, giving her very mediocre assignments and that kind of thing. It just threw out the challenges that were presented to her were just so daunting. Um, and in reality, I was I also just remembering that um, when when she was in England, look uh, at first time looking for an assignment and um, the person, the one person that actually recognized that she had some potential was a woman um, that could see, that could see that, that, that she was multilingual, that, that um, she had a knowledge of France, uh, that, that she really had grit, you know, it took another woman to recognize that, that the, that the men just did not see it at all. I think what amazed me, one of the most things was when she went to Lyon at first and knew absolutely no one and they just plunked her down. And I can't imagine going into a strange place expecting to build up a spy network and not knowing anyone or not having any aid. And that's when she went to the convent has anyone been to Lyon? Yes. Yes, I have. Did you go on that tour where they take you through the tunnels that they used in World War II because the streets are such that they're very wide blocks and you go through interconnecting tunnels. It just is absolutely amazing. And when I was on the tour, they were explaining that the tunnel system had to be given up because they had taken the leader of the resistance wife, uh, the wife of the leader of the uh, Lyon resistance, and they threatened to kill her if they didn't stop using the tunnels. And that's where Claus Bobby, the butcher of Lyon was. And I can't imagine uh, going through that city with so many on your tail ready to kill you. It was just eerie. Which one of the minor characters would you like to meet? Hmm. Would you like to meet Paul Golay or Alien or Fayol or Germain or Lerchat? I'd like to meet the uh, the burning brunette at the uh, who is the one of the the owners of the most popular brothel that uh, she and her girls did so much to uh, yeah. get the guys drunk, had get their tongues loose, go through their pockets and photo things, and even help some of the escapees get to uh, 
a safe zone. So I would love to sit down and talk to her. I think it would be a great story to, to talk to that yeah. burning brunette as they described her. Germaine. Yeah, Germaine. Germaine she, well, she, it was interesting that Virginia had a bit of a prejudice against this line of spying. She thought that in the beginning, at least that's what I read, that they were kind of useless and then she saw how useful that they were. So she kind of had her own little blind spots. But, you know, the interesting character to me was that Fayol, who really changed. I mean, he he's one of the people, you know, you'd hoped everybody else would turn around and see how great she was. But he was the one, and he was probably the most prejudiced and was working against her. And so to me, that was really interesting, that he came around and sang her praises and I guess really helped with a lot of the information even with this book is my understanding, but. Yes, I heard Sonia Purnell speak at the Athenaeum a year ago, and it was mentioned that she did a lot of her research based on Fayol's work because people were still alive when he did this. I felt sorry for the people who worked in the brothel who at the end of the war were then uh, criticized as prostitutes and shamed and had head shaved and so forth for consorting with the enemy and no one took the time to find out what they really did. But then again, I was annoyed with the gall, more than annoyed, how he just pushed aside the resistance and the role of women and all of that. Mm. You know, I thought one thing that I think would be interesting is <clears throat> to hear Gina Haspel, because they mentioned that in the book, that she's, when I guess she got promoted or whatever to the CIA head, that she talked about Virginia. And it would be very interesting, somebody who's on the inside now, to talk about their perspective on Virginia and what they did and how things I mean, I can't imagine some of the things that Virginia did that can never even be done anymore because of technology and the things. I mean, how does spying going on now? I mean, I would, I guess they can't tell you everything, but th there would be a very interesting a perspective of somebody who is now in that organization looking back on her life and maybe she's already, there's something online or whatever, but I thought that would be interesting a reflection of somebody from the inside now looking on the them. internet there's an interview with the author with someone who a woman who was head of cia chief of disguise and jean i forget her name and she herself has written a book and she talks about how virginia certainly was mistreated by the cia and by the men in her work life if you um, google uh, a woman of no importance interview, it will come up. Okay. I, um, okay. It's, I thought uh, it was interesting that um, I um, read a couple of interviews with the author. And one of the things that came up was her aunt, uh, who was only 16, who lives in Baltimore, when she um, met Virginia, when she came back from the war, um, she never talked about the war at all. She never talked about it. Yeah, I had I had read something that, that indicated that even when she was told that she could talk about it, she didn't. That's like the interview they had with some soldiers at the Holyoke Veterans Home in the Times yesterday, and one man never ever mentioned things, mm -hmm. which is typical of yeah. so many. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Well, welcome, new people. Mm -hmm. How do you think Virginia would feel about this book? She never sought or received recognition for her rec for her accomplishments. Um, do you think that she would just say, "Well, why bother? It's over." Well, I don't think this is the, having a book about her would be the sort of thing that she would have liked to have been promoted within the CIA and she would have liked to have had more influence 
than she did within the, within the CIA. But I don't think she was ever looking yeah. for uh, a claim. And so, therefore, I think she would say, oh, dear, she wouldn't want the publicity of these books. I would spend her life in covert activity. So I think to have all of it out there would make her extremely uncomfortable. Right. But I would think that she would like the recognition for all the people that she worked with, many of whom died, and that she would appreciate their mention, their mention and their stories being told. Good point. And I think she'd be shocked that, well, I think she'd be happy that an author took the time to do so much research because so much of the records and the publications and just the interviews were lost through the years. I think she'd be happy to find that somebody took the time for so many years to really dig up her story. I think she'd be very proud of the fact that, hmm, somebody took the time to really dig into my past. One thing that amazed me about the book was life in D.C. France and how the French in that area cooperated with the Germans and the Gestapo. And I just was surprised that it took the resistance so long to get going. And then how long the retaliations lasted after the war. Yeah. You know, I think of VE Day and think, oh, good, it's all over. But then it took years for the communists versus the others to find a path forward. Yeah. Well, even in our own revolution, right, we had those that were Tory supporters and those that were patriots. And I, I think those, you know, sometimes those rivalries and things die hard or they kept, you know, they're kept it on the down low. But you know, it takes a while for people, I think, to get over stuff. Uh-huh, right. Does anyone know what happened when the resistance at towards the end, they were blowing everything up and they were capturing hundreds and in some cases, a thousand prisoners. What did they do with these prisoners? There weren't that many Resistant. I mean, there were more prisoners than there were resistance people. So what did they do with the prisoners until the um, allies came in? Do we have a World War II military historian in the group? <laughs> you know, an interesting thing is our family, they used to be farmers in California. And I have a note from my, or I guess, something from the government that my grandfather, I guess, kept so many German prisoners. And I don't know what that was from, but it was during World War II time. Did some of them get trans? I don't know how that happened, but he, he and they were German prisoners. So there, there, there were, I, yeah, um, there were German prisoners uh, transported to the States and there were some in Lexington. Yeah, so interesting. Where were they held in Lexington on separate farms, Marsha? I, I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that question. <laughs> okay, I don't remember exactly. Uh, that. Yeah, I know. Was wasn't there a uh, prisoner of war camp for Germans in Boston Harbor? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there was a camp for Italians somewhere. Mm -hmm. There was. Uh, but farmers did take prisoners of war and they worked on the farm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What they did in the Midwest. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Richard, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I was wondering if anybody heard me. Uh, my father was assigned to prisoner war camp that was right outside Texas. And they said that what the young men were to work in the area. And they were a small stipend. But my mother, who was there with him, said one of the frightening things was when the alarms went off, because then you knew that one of the uh, prisoners was trying to escape and the dogs were going after them. 
And she said the other thing that was incredible was to watch the discipline of these young men wherever they went. It was obviously that wherever, whatever they were, they were so proud. But it was interesting because I'm um, talking with some people who were on a tour with me, had lived in that area, no idea that there was this huge prisoner of war camp right outside Waco, Texas. And uh, so it's interesting to see where these kids ended up and whatever happened to them, my father never knew. Mm. So much we don't know about war. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any final comments on Virginia? Do you want to hear some of the statistics that, you know, her record of, of some of the things she was involved in? Sure. Okay. So, she sent 37 intelligence reports. She oversaw 27 parachute drops of material for the French resistance. She coordinated the efforts of 1,500 resistance fighters. She oversaw innumerable attacks resulting in more than 170 Germans killed and captured. She managed dozens of acts of sabotage that disrupted German logistics and reinforcements and integrated a joint SOE OSS operational team into her area of operations. Amen. Amen. And on top of all of that, she had her white American teeth ground down so she'd look like a French milkmaid as she worked on the dairy and collected information of the Germans walking by on the road. Didn't they, didn't somewhere in the book they say that she had like four or five different disguises and changed yeah. four or five different times in one day? Yes. Yes. That's yes. amazing. Particularly when she was in Lyon. Yeah, right. Yeah. She certainly was an indomitable spirit. There sure was. Unless it was her mom. <laughs> <It's> amazing. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I am just so surprised. There, there must have been more to that, too. I wonder, you know, I thought when she was working for the CIA that she said that women were married were even of less... And that may have been part of her reason for not marrying is that then she would have no chance that if she stayed single, mm -hmm. that she had that more of a chance. Yeah. I, I don't know if that's the case or not, but I think there's got to be more to that story. That's why it's so hard. Somebody that's so private and wouldn't be interviewed. And, and I think the author was very honest about that, you know, saying, well, this is what we know for sure. And these are the things that we don't know. Um, but um, you know, just amazing. That's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. So, Mary, do you do you want to, we want to turn it over to Sue now for the um, upcoming books, or do you, do you want to make any final comments? Anyone have anything else they'd like to say about this amazing woman? I just can't believe all the expeditions, operations that she went through when all those men were captured at the Villa de Bois and then she got them all out of prison yeah. and then uh, she gets to Spain and the oh. British ambassador won't help her and then she goes to Brittany and then she goes to the Hot Loire and even there today she's a hero. They know more about her than we do here. I, I just think I mean, she, she was like a, a cat that had nine lives. Absolutely. Really just kept on going. I really enjoyed getting to know her. Me too. Marcia, did you say that you read the other book that's about her? Was there any difference that you saw in the two books? Or were you just mentioning that that is another book? Um, I'm mentioning that that's another book. And I, in, I would say that I, I actually like the other one better. But that's just a, that's just a writing style kind of thing as to, as to how something reads um, and how easily, uh, you know, how engaging a book is. Um, What's the, wasn't there, anything was some, there were some differences in what they were concentrating and talking about. Um, what was the name of the other book, Marsha? Uh, something about wolves. I have to find that piece of paper now that seems to have disappeared. I think it was Wolves of the Door, something yeah, like that. Door. Wolves of the Door. 
close at the door. Was if, that if, early? If I could add just if I could add just one more comment. Being uh -huh. a male and listening and looking at all of you women, if somebody sat down and tried to write a small report of you and you standing next to this other woman, being a male, I had things privileged. You being all female, what in your life could you say, this was important to me and this is what I stood up for. Nobody knows, but I know deep inside, I stood for this. You know, all of you have to have that point. You know, I'm at the age where I know that anybody my age had to have had blocks in their way and discrimination and stuff like that. I just admire the ability, you know, uh, of women. But once again, if they made a little story of your life, what, what would stand out? I'd be fascinated to see what someone else saw in your lives. Mm -hmm. Wow. Cool. That's a very interesting That's, point. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. Book. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mary, thank you so much for leading our book discussion. It was great. Oh, thank you. And now thank you. we will talk about next year's suggestions. Take it away, Sue. Okay. Well, first, um, I want to, I just want to mention, I do see a few unfamiliar names here. And if you want to um, be on our email list, just send a note into uh, Sarah, programs at lexingtonhistory.org. Let, let her know that you want to be on our special email list, and we'll keep you posted on anything that's happening. <clears throat> so those of you who would like to stay and discuss some of the suggested books for next year, you're welcome to. If you don't want to stay, that's okay. I won't take it personally. Um, so <laughs> I had sent out a list of books that had been suggested from various sources. And what I'd like to do is um, if someone wants to comment, if you could raise your hand so we can keep a little order. Uh, the people that I can't see, um, Sarah, tell me they have the ability to raise their hand. And can you see them? Can I see them? You're muted. I think so. Sorry. There should be a button somewhere. Um, let me see at the at the top where it says non-video participants. If you click that, it should allow you to see those folks. It'll still be a black box, but okay. I think they'll still be able to raise their I'll hand. Be able to tell, I'll be able to tell that they want to talk. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Okay. So um, I sent out a, a three-page list. Uh, what I'd like to do today is get comments from people and then get the, I'll try to get the list down to about 10 or 12 that seem to be interesting to folks. And I'll send that out in a few days for people to vote on and we'll, we'll get it down to the final five. So uh, Linda Dixon, you have your hand up. I actually just have a question from Marsha. Mm -hmm. Marcia, I was fascinated about the two books about Hedy Lamarr. She was, there was something on TV about her just yesterday. Uh -huh. Did you read either of the two? Do you, did you look into them? Um, because they sound fascinating. Mm -hmm. And um, do you happen to know if they would have enough, either one of them would have enough gravitas to be I'm included on our list? <laughs> or might they just be kind of fluffy? Um, I do not. Okay. Um, it sounds personally very interesting. Yeah. Uh, Nancy, did you have something? Yeah, my, um, I'm not sure which book it is, but uh, it's on my list from my hairdresser who always has the best books. Uh, <laughs> don't laugh. She was second in her class at Needham High and fought to be able to go off and become a hairdresser. <laughs> And she has the best books. So I can find out her which one it is that she read. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I got my hair done yesterday, folks. Um, you look wonderful. Um, I can't wait. So okay. if you want me done tomorrow. Same here. If you want me to call the email her. I'm waiting for a phone call. <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so comments on books on the list. Who else? Let's bring back Stephen Polio. Yes, I agree yeah, with that. Julio, like okay, yeah, that yeah. sounds good. And Linda Webb, you wanted? I wanted to do that also. Which yeah. one? Uh, the Voice Voyage of Mercy. Voyage of Mercy. Yeah. I. It's uh, on the top of the third page. Voyage of Mercy. 
and I want to do Serena Williams, uh, Serena Zabin. What, what is it? S uh, say again, Martha. Serena Zabin's book. Oh yes, the Boston Massacre. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's a good. Uh, it's a good time for that one. She's been all over with her lectures. That ought to be a good one. We yeah, she did a lecture at the uh, at the uh, Cary Library that was excellent. So yes, I would uh, think that would be a good choice. One thing that'll be nice with all of this is we might be able to get more authors involved. Right, right. And Mary Keenan. Maybe if we find out when Serena is coming back to visit her folks in Lexington, yeah. we could schedule her book talk or her author. You know what I mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's kind of what I was thinking. Okay. We, we, we'd pencil her in for whenever she happens to be around. And how about the other author from Canton, Stephen Knott, about Washington and Hamilton? Would he yeah. be a good choice? We could probably get him. He did an I, excellent I, talk, I, too. I, I started that book, and it's very infrequent that I can't get through something, but I just stopped. Really? Really. So if, if anybody else, I, I, it just was not telling me anything that I didn't know. It what didn't seem interesting. It was seemed all over the place. Oh, interesting. So anybody, if somebody would like to contradict me on that, they're more than welcome to. But. OK, well, we want to hear the negatives and the positives. Yeah. Mary Keenan again. Um, I read The Woman's Hour, The Great Fight to Win the Vote by Elaine Weiss, and I thought it was a great read, and I had no idea so much machinations had to go on in each state. This was Tennessee for women getting the right to vote, and I know that Elaine Weiss is a good friend of Kathy Jacob, so maybe Kathy would know when she might be in this area. Mm -hmm. It's number two on the right. first page. Okay, anyone else? Yes, Joan. Um, the one that I, I would very be really interested in reading about Frederick Law Olmsted, selfishly because being a tour guide in Boston, but it sounds interesting, Spying on the South, an Odyssey Across the American Divide. Um, it should be an interesting read. I've read it. Have you read it, Mary? Yes, I thought it was wonderful. It was one of the best books I read last year. Oh, great. And Tony, unfortunately, passed away when he was in Washington going to give his first book talk. Oh. Like, right oh. after it came out last spring. Oh. But he explained to me, or the book explained to me, what the middle America thought and why they thought that way. Mm -hmm. And it is just fascinating. I would highly recommend it. I would love to reread it. Oh, good. Which one was that, Mary? Um, Spying on the South by Tony Horwitz. Way, way at the end. He's, it's the next to the last one at the end of the list. He, he was married to Geraldine Brooks, the one who wrote this, the story of the book and Caleb's Crossing and mm -hmm. other right. interesting books. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, Sounds good. What you're saying about the book is interesting because I read the book right after it came out. I didn't like it at all. It was too much about football and too much about, I don't know, uh, it didn't seem to have any substance to it. And maybe that's because I'm from the Midwest. I don't know. I don't remember anything about football. Yeah, if, if you go into that book thinking you're going to learn something about Olmsted, you don't, it doesn't happen. It's, oh, huh. it's, it's an entirely different subject matter, I think. Boo hoo. I'm right. sorry. Um, good. Okay, uh, Nancy Lattimore had her end up first. I, think. Um, I read at the beginning of this whole mess the, the Splendid and the Vile. Mm hmm. I'm ready. Yeah. The last one. The book, I thought it was wonderful. I just had a great time learning all about the family and everything that was going on that first year of the war. Um, you know, just learning. It's, it's, it's the war. It's about the Americans and the Brits and everybody else. But to, to get into the, all the personalities and how everybody, just Churchill and the family and, the, and all the 
this it, it, I don't know if other people must have read it, but it's just mm -hmm. I just thought it was a great book. Yeah, it's good. When I saw the uh, recommendation for it, I was thinking, uh, we usually don't do outside America stuff, but Churchill was half American, so that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would, we can make that qualify. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think, Linda Webb, did you have your hand up? I was going to say The Splendid in the Vile. Okay. Okay, any other comments? Linda Dixon. The epic rivalry of Clay Calhoun and Webster. Um, I, I, I'm just very interested in that 10 years before the Civil War when there was so much going on, you know, and those are three giants and that's probably, uh, I, I did not read the book, so I don't know, but it's just a, 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 a very active time in our history and three very, <laughs> interesting legends is that the heirs of the founders linda the heirs of the founders yes okay and mary i think bottom, you had some bottom of page about. one yes mary you had some comments about that did you read that mary not yet okay i, I was given the book and it looks fascinating ah, okay but can i say i haven't had time uh, sure <laughs> <laughs> what That's else have you been part. doing <laughs> okay all right, uh, let's see. So, um, Jane, do you have your hand up or are you just- No, no, okay. I'm just resting. I'm just listening. Okay. I'm good. All right then, uh, two, four, six, seven. That only gives us seven to choose from, but um, I'll, pick, I'll pick a couple of others <laughs> based, on, based on what some people have been saying to me about them. Uh, Joan, yes. I, I actually um, tuned in to an interview with the two gentlemen who wrote Lincoln on the Verge uh, by Ted Whitmer, and it sounded pretty interesting because it's, it's the story of, of him getting to the actual uh, inaugural. So that might be an interesting read. Uh, that's 624 pages. Yeah, I know. That's, that's the only drawback. <laughs> No. Oh, we, we could read Grant and spend the whole year on it. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I, I still that. have that sitting here. So at some point, I'll get into it. Uh, what about, I was a little surprised. What about The British Are Coming? The first of what's supposed to be a, um, a trilogy. trilogy. Yeah. Oh, the Atkinson book. That's a, long, that's a long one, too. But um, people but have thrown local. it out several times times on my to read list the british are coming the war for america it's the bottom of the first page so if we did that one could we split it in half if we did that one we split it in half maybe we could and he's a great writer he's good yes he is i've read a little bit of it i i am i'm not too far through it, but he is he tries to make it interesting so i remember I, the first the first time i saw it and i didn't want to say anything what, the first time I saw it in a bookstore and I thought, oh my God, he can't even get the title right. The mess, rest of it must be junk. <laughs> but I understand he explains, he explains why he says the British are coming. So, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah some of these uh, longer ones, if we wanted to, to split them into two sessions, there's no reason why we couldn't. So, okay. Are there any other comments on any of these? Oh, well, I just dipped into the Atkinson book and I looked up April 19th yeah. just because. And yeah, I, I do that all the time. Too, yeah. He talked about the apricot dawn. And I thought any military historian who's noticing the weather and the dawn. There you go. I thought I'll read the whole book, but not now. <laughs> <laughs> I, always, I always read the, uh, on, on books like that, I always read the Lexington session. Right, section. right to assure myself that they know what they're talking about. <laughs> That's exactly what I do in a, in a bookstore. I'll, I'll immediately go to that part of it and I figure, okay, if they got that right, I guess I can trust the rest of it. <laughs> yes, yeah, so the worst part was when I did that with a college textbook and my textbook told me that Captain Parker was killed. Oh. Oh. On the I didn't end up taking that class. Yeah. Uh, Jeez. How about the... um? 
I read a little blurb on, it's a new book, basically, the, I think it is, The Legacy of Benjamin Rush, you know, something that's a little bit different. Oh, yeah. the doctor? Uh-huh. Medical pioneer. Is that on our list, or is that something Yeah, new? it's on the list. Yeah. Oh, there it is. Yeah. I like that on the last page. Yeah. Might be something different, you know, we don't really talk much about Benjamin Rush. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should in the middle of a pandemic. Maybe we should. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> that was his thing, the, the yellow fever. That's Index. right. Ah, okay. Well, or we could read about the smallpox wars up in Marblehead. Ah. Oh. Which one is that? I it's think not. It's book, not. It's, book, it's, book, it's a relative of mine. But anyway. Smallpox. So, yeah, they, at Cat, Cat Island, they set out to inoculate, and the town had a riot. And the Glover said, "Well, uh, they put a cannon in their um, the doorway and said, uh, we 'We'll greet the community. Send them in,' because <laughs> they wanted to shut down the hospital. They didn't want no vaccinations, no nothing. Right. All the fear going on. <laughs> so anyway, somehow I think we may have had enough of this by then." Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Okay, I will go ahead and uh, get our short list together and send it out for folks. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. Um, so I will go ahead and send out a short list in the next few days and we'll get everybody's vote and uh, then Joan and I will uh, Get it down to the final five. Oh boy. <laughs> Thank you. And Take care, everyone. Stay yeah. healthy and safe. Happy, Mary. happy. And Mary, you did an excellent job as always. Thank we appreciate you. Yeah. you so much. Thank well, you so much. Mary participating. And hopefully uh, by the fall, who knows, we might even be able to get together and have some oh, food. We'll be able to. <laughs> yeah. We'll Good sit to in a big you. circle out in uh, Emory Park. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, we can Thanks do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Thanks, Sarah, for setting this up and doing the technological part of it. Um, and uh, Good job, Sarah. Have a have a great Thank summer. You. Happy reading. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Stay safe. Bye. Thank Stay you. Safe. Bye.